So this is going to be part one of uh, an introduction of how to teach ESL, and I'd like to introduce us with uh, starting off with you. So you probably have some assumptions of what an ESL teacher and what an ESL class should be looking like. So why don't we try to get at what some of those assumptions are? and then uh, we can move from there. So why don't we start? Just imagine that an ESL class is going on and that you just walk in just straight in the middle and you just get you know an idea of what's going on but you're it's in the middle of class, you have no idea what the teacher is doing. What would you expect that it would look like? What would the students be doing? What would the teacher be doing? What would the students' and teachers' attitudes be like? What would the you know what would it look like in there? What would the mood be like? What type of an atmosphere would you expect? And if you thought it was a good class, what would you expect? And if you thought it was a bad class, what would you expect? Okay. Um, so once you're done with that activity, you can start the video again. And um, one thing that, <clears throat> and I'm going to start with. Um, a few characteristics of, of ESL classes. So the first thing that I want to emphasize is that ESL teaching is a skill, okay? It is not a personality trait. Being a good teacher is uh, specific actions that people take in the class, all of which can be learned, and it's not like just, you know, it's not just like some people have it and some people don't. You can learn it, you can get better at it, y you know, if you read about this stuff and you watch these videos and do whatever it is for your professional development, you can get better at uh, teaching. So what, first of all, let's talk about what makes good and bad classrooms, okay? So I'm going to give you three classrooms and I'd like you to think about whether or not you think they are good or bad classrooms and what you think could be improved or, you know, what aspects of them sound good and what aspects of them sound bad. So the first one is a large group of students. It's maybe 30 or 35 students. And the teacher has the class divided into groups. So let's say groups of five or six. And um, they're, so they're in quite large groups. And they're, each group is working on a project together. And the teacher is not really doing much, just kind of observing. Maybe if one of the groups has a question, then the teacher will answer the question or something like that. But they're not, you know, the teacher's not really doing anything, just standing around waiting for them to finish the project. Number two, they are the class. The teacher has set up a pair work activity. So one student is working with the student next to them, and they are working through some some sort of an activity where that involves two people and once again the teacher is not really doing much but is going around listening to what the students are doing and providing feedback on their mistakes and making sure that they aren't continuously making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Okay number three um, is the students are using their dictionaries to do a fill-in-the-blank activity. Okay, it is a uh, vocabulary activity. They're looking up the words in the dictionary and, um, you know, filling in the sentences with the, the correct word. Everyone is quietly working and the teacher is doing nothing. Just standing there doing nothing. Okay, I would say that I would like you to think a little bit <laughs> about which of these are good and bad classrooms. And now I'm going to answer the question for you. All of these are modern ESL classrooms, I would say, all of them. Um, okay, so let's get a little bit into the uh, modern ESL theory. Um, one of the first things that we think in modern ESL theory is that students learn with or without teachers, okay? Students do not need teachers to learn. Um, Students learn from the internet, they learn from books, they learn from magazines, they learn from just going around and talking to people. They learn, you know, f from like tons of tons of different places. They do not need teachers to learn. Um, teachers can help, but you know, they're not a necessary part of the equation at all. So, I mean, that opens up the question, do teachers help? I mean, why do we have ESL classes? Why do do we need ESL classes? Do we need teachers? Um, 
yeah, so I'll let you answer that by yourself. So I want you to think of a teacher, okay? Think of your favorite teacher and of your worst teacher and what made your favorite teacher your favorite teacher and what made your not-so-favorite teacher your uh, uh, worse than the other one, okay? Um, and there are two things, two types of teachers that I would like to kind of, you know, emphasize you not to be like. Okay, so the first one is the entertainer teacher. The entertainer teacher is the teacher that goes around and may, has a really funny sense of humor and has tons of stories and has tons of jokes and, you know, always making the class laugh and everybody's just sitting around listening to all these hilarious stories, which, I mean, may be helpful a little bit in terms of, like, listening, but, and it might be a fun class and the students might enjoy it and stuff like that, but it's not necessarily the greatest way to, you know, uh, facilitate learning. Uh, the next one is the traditional teacher who, you know, the students are quiet and then he's up there lecturing about, you know, whatever it is and he's very knowledgeable and explaining grammar and whatever it is. But the problem with both of these two is that um, the students are not involved, okay? So the first thing, the first kind of like teaching myth that we need to get rid of is that um, the model of learning where it's like, the, the student is like an empty slate and they don't like have anything and then the teacher just kind of like transmits this knowledge to them is not, is not I mean that's not how it, that's not how it's viewed in modern methods and that's not what studies show to be the most effective way of teaching things okay so teaching does not equal learning like you the teacher can't make the students learn and um, the teacher can't, like, you know, the teacher can't learn for, for the students, okay? And um, the, le the learning must be done by the student's personal effort, okay? The, like, in the traditional model, there's kind of this idea that, like, the students listening attentively is really helpful, and actually it's not necessarily the most helpful thing in the world. What we want is the students to be working and, and trying to figure things out and, you know, working hard and so since we can't require them to learn we can't like force them to learn and make them learn but what we can do is set up conditions that make learning possible and even likely so we're going to talk about what those conditions are shortly but this is the end of part one and thank you for listening